Thank you so much. Well, I am super excited to be here. I will uh, do the official opening. So welcome everyone to this meeting of Inform, the Commonwealth Club's Innovation Lab. Uh, you can find Inform online at informsf.org. I'm Cheryl Sandberg, and I'm really excited to be here. I lived in the Castro when I first moved over a decade ago, and so it's exciting uh, to be back home. And the last time I was at this theater was just a few months ago for the Mother's Day um, singing rendition of Frozen. <laughs> and there were um, hundreds of little girls and boys that marched across the stages in costume, and it was really special. So this is a different uh, and equally or more important type of evening, but it's exciting to be, be back in the Castro. I have the great pleasure of introducing uh, a phenomenal woman and a great friend, Marianne Cooper. Uh, Marianne is a Stanford sociologist. She works at the Clayman Institute for Gender Research. And I first got to know who Marianne was when she wrote this article called The Other F Word. Any guesses what that word was? <laughs> Females, a good guess. Others? <laughs> Feminism. And the article was about women in college who were taking a feminist studies class, but didn't want anyone to call them a feminist <laughs> and didn't associate with the word feminist. And Marianne brought such a sense of humor to the topic, but also a seriousness with which the issue is raised. So then when I was looking for a partner to lead the research for Lean In, I met and interviewed Marianne and then had the experience of spending an entire year working together. Uh, Marianne's a pretty special combination of someone who is a deeply, deeply you know, fantastic academic who understands research, understands methodology, understand what makes research valid and what doesn't, but also has this incredible desire to make the world a better place, to make the world more equal for women and make the world more equal for people who don't have the same economic opportunities uh, that they deserve. And that's the passion that comes out in this book. She's also an amazing person and just has been a great friend to me and I know a great friend to so many people in this audience. So please join me in welcoming to Inform, Marianne Cooper. <laughs> so we are here tonight to talk about Cut Adrift, Families in Insecure Times. This is Marianne's new book just out. Um, and it talks about families coping in insecure times. And it's actually a very intimate look at the challenges facing modern families. Our goal is to have this conversation. I'll get a chance to ask Marianne questions, then you'll get a chance to ask Marianne questions, and really hopefully leave with a better understanding of how we understand economic insecurity that occurs to many different families in many different ways, but also what we can do as a society and as a community to address it. So I'm gonna start at the very beginning. Marianne, you are interested in so many things. You are interested in economic insecurity. You are interested in the sociological underpinnings of what makes people tick. You're obviously very interested in feminism uh, and gender. Um, and this is a remarkable book. I, as you know, read it on a vacation with my husband where he thought maybe I would not be reading a book, but it was the galley and I couldn't put it down. It was really amazing. Um, Marianne, what led you to write this book at this time? I wrote it because a major part of the story of what's happening in our society was missing. So for the past few decades, we know inequality has been on the rise, insecurity has been on the rise. So we now have a hollowed out middle class, families are losing jobs, losing homes. That story is mostly told through statistics. So academics look at tax records and job reports and what they've concluded is that right now, we have almost unprecedented levels of inequality and insecurity. By some measures, things haven't been this bad since the Great Depression. And that's a pretty dramatic conclusion. But I felt like the dramatic punch of it wasn't coming across in these statistical tables and charts that so meticulously um, documented. And so I felt like somebody needed to go and talk to people about how they're coping with this, right? So underneath these hard numbers are people who live out these trends in their everyday lives. So we know more of them are experiencing insecurity. We know more of them are on their own. 
um, to cope with it, but we don't know how they're coping, and we also don't understand how this growing divide between the haves and the have-nots in our society uh, changes the way we manage and experience security and insecurity. So let's start there. Um, as you say, there have been long-standing trends which are leading towards economic insecurity and you know, further income disparity, and I think income insecurity for many families. And that was all happening, and then 2008 happens, and a recession happens. Um, why don't we start by talking about the overall economic trends? What is happening in the U.S. economy? How did the 2008 recession affect us? So it's a big story. There are actually lots and lots of books and articles about it. But I think three of the most important things that have happened for families is the decline of middle-income jobs, what we would call the shift in risk, which I can explain, and then growing inequality. So uh, it used to be that our economy was based on manufacturing, and today it's now based on service, services. So about 80% of jobs are in the service sector now. And in comparison to manufacturing jobs, service sector jobs are, they, well, they pay less, and they come with fewer benefits, and they're much more insecure. And then layered on top of this is that workers no longer have the leverage that they once did to collectively bargain for better wages and better working conditions. And that beca that's because unions are on a, a steep decline. So after World War II and into the 1950s, about a third of employed people were represented by unions, and we've reached a new historical low, which is that only 11% of workers are represented by unions. And that also has another effect, which is it's not just that workers can't collectively bargain to get a better deal. It's that this has er eroded a moral commitment to fair pay. So it used to be, even if you weren't in a union, unions set the wage and other employers uh, respected that. And that, so that increased the wage for a lot of other people who weren't in unions. So we've got a double whammy here. Um, and then the other thing that occurred is what, what is called the shift in risk. And there's really been a rewriting of the social contract between employers and employees. It used to be based on uh, mutual loyalties and mutual protections. So that means that uh, employers gave people good wages and good benefits, and in return, people worked really hard and used their talents to help build that company. But what's happened is that increasingly risk has been offloaded by governments and corporations onto individuals and their families. So if you think about the movement from pensions to 401ks, employers used to share risk with us, now we're really on the own to save our own money for retirement, and we're on the hook for any miscalculations that we make. So all of these things together have really gotten us to a point where the types of jobs that created a thriving middle class in this country are harder to find and harder to hold on to. So it's definitely tougher out there than it used to be. Um, and families are really experiencing that. The question is how tough? And that really depends on where you sit in relation to all of this. Because you've got all this growing insecurity and shift in risk, and then over here you have this rise in income and wealth inequality. So there are some highly educated and highly skilled workers who are actually doing really well. And they still have really good jobs. So these trends play out for different families in different ways. So to write the book, you interviewed over 50 families over long periods of time. And what you'll find if you read the book is that uh, the information is detailed and it's intimate. You are not just able to describe how these families are living and what are the situations, but in really deep detail how they feel, why they feel how they feel, which I know as a sociologist you taught me through the lean-in process is what we're always looking for, the reason, the why, the underlying reason. Um, so let's start with the methodology why these interviews, how did you conduct these interviews, how did you get 50 families to invite you this deeply into their lives? Well, because I wanted to understand this more personal, emotional side of it, I did interviews and uh, ethnography. So I went out and wanted to find families, uh, rich, middle class, and poor, and interview them um, about you know, the obstacles in their life. But I wanted to add something to that. Uh, so I, I followed a smaller group of families around uh, in, a, in a very in-depth way. But like really followed them around. Really followed them around. <laughs> <laughs> like they went here, you went here. Yeah, they like went I ate dinner with yeah. them. I was in the car <laughs> when we picked up the kids, um, went to the soccer games. I, I really got to know them. Um, the hardest part about doing this is recruiting the families. 
Um, and because specifically, it's always hard to, to recruit people to be in your research. Um, 